friends, family members, and most importantly, the data science class of 2019. It's my distinct honor to address the first data science commencement in one of the nation's first data science major programs at the first university that took the risk of inviting me to speak. <laughs> last chance, Dean Culler, last chance. We're good to go? All right. Thank you for letting me share this special day with you, your families, and this extraordinary community. Speaking today, it feels like a really big responsibility, I have to say. I mean, I'm one of the few things that stands between you and tonight's series finale of Game of Thrones. <laughs> I know, I know where I stand. Someone asked me if I was nervous to speak to such a big crowd today, and I said, well, why would I be? It's not like it's the first day of Data 8. <laughs> so no, I'm not nervous, but I gotta say, the more I learn about you guys, the more awestruck I become. All the work you did to create this brand new major, the skills you've gained, not just by studying data science, but by teaching it too. Your ambitious appetite for academics. I learned that many of you are double or even triple majors. And of course, the Sway brothers, they're quadruple majors. If I tried to finish four majors, I would still be in college. <laughs> so many of you have already accomplished great things. I heard that one of you accidentally signed up for the wrong class and used the skills you learned there to write software for NASA that governments use for climate change. That should be Berkeley's new motto, even our mistakes make the world a better place. <laughs> And of course, the most impressive of all, some of you passed Professor Sahai's CS189 class. <laughs> right? Right? And for that, you deserve an extra round of applause. <laughs> you know, data science technologies have advanced light years since I graduated college, but in many respects, we're still in the wild west of data ethics. The rules are still being written. And so the questions you've wrestled with here, they're not just the most important ones of our time, they're going to be important for a long time. Questions like, where is the line between surveillance and social good? Or how about, how do we design data sets that respect people of all backgrounds? Or, is a hot dog a sandwich? In studying data science applications, some of you examined Chicago's traffic data, and you built an algorithm to predict the most dangerous intersections. That's a potentially life-saving use of data. It also reminds me of some of the best advice I've ever received, and I think it's highly relevant for you here today. Look both ways before you cross the street. Now, this is something your parents likely taught you years ago, and yes, looking both ways is great advice especially if you want to avoid being hit by a self-driving vehicle. But to me, it means so much more than that. It means you have a responsibility to look at a problem from all sides. And in a diverse world, one in which we all bring different backgrounds and beliefs to a common conversation, you have a responsibility to look at a person from all sides. We know that one of the best ways to mitigate bias is to create a sense of belonging. It's hard to do, but it really matters. And in the boardroom, I've been in meetings where it's painfully obvious when somebody or some type of person is talking too much. In the classroom, I know you've experienced the same. We won't name names, you know who you are. But what's less obvious is which person or which type of person is talking too little. Often, it's because they don't think their voices are welcome, so they stay quiet, they fade, and they start to feel invisible. If you're one of those people, I'm here to tell you that you're mistaken. You do belong. We want your input. We need your voice. I know it's not always easy, and I know you need help. So to the rest of us who could lend a hand, we have a choice to make. 
we can choose to notice, invite, and encourage the quiet ones to join the conversation. It's a choice that can yield great impact and one that I hope all of you will make. I want to share a secret with you. The thing that keeps me up at night is not my responsibility to deliver billions of dollars of revenue to Microsoft, although I do think about that about a million times a day. <laughs> what plagues me at night is my responsibility to create a sense of belonging for every person in my organization. My responsibility to create a culture that can enable change by fostering inclusion in the face of inherent inequality. You see, I know our employees can solve just about any problem, no matter how hard or how complex, but only if we empower them, only if we see them, and more than that, only if they feel seen. And you've been trained well to do that here at Berkeley, for sure, not just because of the diversity of your backgrounds, but because of the diversity of your strengths. Venetia Swamy is one of our AI engineers at Microsoft before she came to Seattle. She taught Data 8 as a Berkeley grad student. Venetia said that when she sat in a CS class here, she'd look to her left, she'd see an economics major. She'd look to her right, and she'd see an English major. And she noticed how they viewed the same problem in different ways, through different eyes, different experiences, and different expectations. That's the start of empathy. That's the core ingredient of inclusion. And that's our duty in a diverse world. The tension of the digital era is that even as it brings us together in unprecedented ways, it's making it harder for us to connect as humans. We're tweeting and posting and gramming, myself included, but we're not really talking to each other. We're not really listening to each other. We're not really seeing each other. So before you offer an opinion, before you come to a conclusion, or heck, what about before you conclude a meeting? Do what you do before you cross the street and look, I mean really look, both ways. Okay, second piece of advice. Looking both ways is great life advice, but when you think about it, it doesn't tell you the optimal time to cross the street or even the optimal speed. It simply reminds you to be aware of your surroundings. That's why you need to remember this. Chase awareness, not certainty. Who's to say that we know the difference between right and wrong? I mean, I know it's hard to believe, but these funny hats, they don't mean we have a monopoly on knowledge or morality. Ones and zeros are unambiguous. They are certain. The concept of right and wrong is simply not. The ethical questions you've thought about here are hard, one, are hard ones, for sure. Even the hot dog question, especially the hot dog question. But you do have to be aware, aware that data is intrinsically flawed. Just as the world it describes is flawed, just as the people who design it are flawed. And we must be aware that none of these facts absolve us of the harm caused if we abuse the power of data. At my company, we try to reinforce our awareness by testing our choices against a few timeless principles. We ask things like, is this fair? Is it inclusive? Is it safe and accountable? Does it respect privacy and provide security? Elie Wiesel survived the Holocaust and won a Nobel Peace Prize. He said that the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. Well, indifference is also the opposite of awareness. Indifference is also the opposite of action. Indifference breaks down community instead of building it. When we're indifferent, we absolve ourselves of responsibility when it's needed most. Recently, I was with a large group of leaders discussing an important change we're driving in our business. Now, this is a group of amazingly accomplished, sought-after tech execs. But I gotta tell you, it was a really tough conversation. We just weren't getting the results that we needed. 
and I was getting super frustrated. Well, eventually we figured it out. Basically, everybody in the room thought somebody else had the ball. They were counting on somebody else to rise to the occasion. Effectively, they were sitting it out. You see, indifference is the enemy of progress. It's the enemy of leadership. And it's most certainly the enemy of community. To make data the best that it can be, we must try to beat its bias. But you can't beat bias if you're a bystander. So how do you keep yourself aware about what's right and fair and just, especially after you leave this campus and the honest conversations it welcomes? I think one answer is in the school's leadership principles, which instruct you to be a student always. And to that I'd add this. Please, be a teacher always too, because you're the ones who've thought about these questions more than most people. You're not just graduates today. You're not just alumni. Now, you're the experts. Many of you have already experienced the joy of teaching by being TAs, mentors, advisors, and tutors. But to be a teacher, you don't have to stand in front of a lecture hall making announcements like Daddy De Niro. (laughs) You can simply speak up when you think others are sitting out. You can make a difference, especially if you see others are indifferent. So please, don't just go through the motions of designing algorithms. Keep your eyes open. Keep yourself open to talking about the inequities caused by the world's inequalities. And bring that awareness to your newly earned authority. Because if you don't, who will? Okay, I won't be much longer. Pre-game for Game of Thrones is coming. So here's my third and final piece of advice for you on your graduation day. There's only one you, so ditch this notion of multiple personas. Back in the 90s, when I was just starting my career, and come to think of it, you were all in the womb, I thought there was a work Kate and a life Kate, and I wasn't alone. Most people in my era were coached to try and fit in to a standard professional mold. So I did, I was compliant. I mean, I wanted to fit in. But then, just as you're all about to find out, life happened. And managing two sets of me became overwhelming. So I did something rare and unique for my time. I brought the real me to work every day. All of me. Every bit of my Kateness. And I ditched the idea of a standard mold. I started sharing learnings from my life outside of work, inside of work. And that's when my career really began. Yeah, people were a little shocked at first, for sure, but they were also delighted and disarmed. They got insights from me that they never would have gotten otherwise. Here's a quick example. When I was in my early 20s, I really wanted my boyfriend to be able to read my mind. So badly. I mean, wouldn't that be awesome? Well, spoiler alert, he failed to meet my expectation. So instead, I learned how to share my thoughts with him more often and more clearly. He started doing the same. And as it turns out, great communication has been the foundation for our 30-year marriage. That experience, there he is. That experience changed me as a person. And I brought that new person to work. It helped me be more direct and transparent with my coworkers, my customers, and my partners. We stopped playing guessing games. We got a lot more efficient and a lot more satisfied with each other. Here's a more recent example. 18 months ago, I moved to Seattle away from my family on the East Coast. This means I've had to delegate the solemn duty of caring for my aging parents to my siblings. It hasn't been easy at all. But you know what I'm learning? My siblings are amazing. They're really good communicators, collaborators, and caregivers. And I love and respect them more now than I ever have. Well, that experience changed me as a person, too. So I brought that new person to work with me. And I learned just how powerful it can be to trust teammates with things I've never considered delegating before. My entire team 
is better off because of it. Those are just two ways that my life perspectives helped me inside of work. But it wouldn't have happened if I stayed locked in this notion that work Kate should somehow be different than life Kate. Believe me, all of us on this side are working hard to build a world that accepts every single one of you for who you are. Don't let us down by dressing up as the person you think we want you to be at work. We want you to be you. We need you to be you. Well, I said earlier that our understanding of how we use data is still being defined. Starting today, right now, it will be defined by you. Over the last few years, you've mastered the skills of writing and manipulating code. Now, we need you to write the code, the code of ethics, the code of behavior for designing and applying data science. We need you to be the models for how one should responsibly wield this great power in a world being eaten by software. You know, it probably won't be as clear cut as the Constitution or the Hippocratic Oath. And you might even have trouble fitting it in a word cloud. Instead, it will be written by your actions, by the example you set through the choices you make. And don't forget that every single day, you'll make countless choices. Will you notice the quiet person in the room and invite that person to join the conversation? Will you think about how your algorithm impacts people of all backgrounds? Will you have the courage to show up to work as your authentic self and invite others to do the same? Every day, in a million ways, big and small, you will make important choices. Class of 2019, none of the problems we face today are really technology problems. They're human problems. It's up to you to make sure the conversations we're having about the responsible use of data advance the conversations of inclusion in real life, too. It's up to you to use the influence of your incredibly valuable degree to create cultures that enable change. That's how we make sure that in the age of artificial intelligence, machines won't be the only ones learning. Class of 2019, I hope you remember to look both ways, to chase awareness, not certainty. And remember, there's only one you. Congratulations. Go Bears. Thanks for having me, Jacob. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm glad to speak with you again. Um, so really curious to get your perspective specifically around leadership, because a lot of people who are going to be watching this are either um, current or aspiring leaders. Mm -hmm. And I want to start off with why, why do you think you became a leader? Because I'm assuming you were surrounded by a lot of very smart and talented people, people mm -hmm. who could have easily have taken the role that, that you have taken on as for some reason you got the role and not anybody else. What, what makes you so special or unique? Oh, wow. That's a, you're starting with the PhD level before we <laughs> even get the warm ups. How about, you know, like, uh, I don't What's know. What's your favorite What's color? color? Yeah. <laughs> what would you sure. eat today? Gosh. Um, so a couple, that's a really complex question because it's not like it's my first job. It's not like it's my first role. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of in the back on the back nine, as they say, yeah. um, of the career. So it's a culmination of experiences that I think are really well suited to the role of leading commercial transformation. You know, Satya, Judson Althoff, um, Jean-Philippe Courtois, they needed a leader of the U.S. business that had a combination of things, big deal making, uh, leading large teams, driving change, um, all of these things I've done in, in different parts of my career. And so I kind of had the portfolio. I think I'm, I'm also the first female president of, I think that having a diverse candidate was also important to them. 
Um, so that's why, I mean, the existential question of why are you a leader at all? I go all the way back to this notion that leadership does not necessarily mean um, managing people. Leadership is a is kind of a state of mind. It's and it's an important distinction because I tell everybody in our organization, like I expect you to lead every day. I don't care how many people actually report into you. And and there are certain characteristics that we're looking for for leadership, and you can start demonstrating them whether or not you have other people depending on you for performance reviews. If you get my drift. Yep. Well, to give people a little bit of context, can you share a little bit about, um, so how, how big is the team that, that you manage and uh, the, the yeah. P&L? How much uh, yeah, money for, are you responsible for? So it's it's $45 billion. It's across all of our uh, products um, and services, across all customer segments, private and public. And it's a team of 10,000 people. So we do you know, the marketing, the sales, the service and the operations associated yep. with generating that revenue, which is close to half of the enterprise revenue. Yeah, so definitely a considerable <laughs> size yeah. team. I, I have a few nights where I kind of stare at the ceiling going, gosh, it's a lot of revenue we got to get. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about how um, this position came about. So what was your experience? I mean, did, did you live in a lot of different parts of the world? Were yeah. you a part of different teams and different roles and functions? Yeah, that's a great question. So the answer to that is, yeah, I've been, um, you know, in a bunch of different places in companies, but I think it really all started. I got an engineering degree, wasn't uh, the best engineer. And I was in a lab, Bell Labs at the time, which, you know, for those of you that are old enough to remember, it was a super great place to be if you were an engineer, um, you know, part of the research facility of, of AT&T. But it just wasn't a good fit. And I, I needed more interaction with people, with customers. And so I went into sales and, and AT&T was kind enough to help get me there. Um, mm -hmm. But then I, I realized really quickly that I, I needed an MBA to sort of augment or round out my my education because I was so deeply technical, but I didn't have a lot of the other pieces of yeah. marketing, finance, you know, and all the things that you need in order to to lead from a business perspective. And and the reality is, it was the job that I had after getting my MBA that kind of opened my mind to who I wanted to be as a leader. And I, I went into management consulting at Deloitte. And I spent six years going across industry, um, mm. across functions, basically helping large scale uh, enterprises drive change. And I fell in love with that as my thing. You know, everybody kind of has yeah. a, a strength or a superpower or whatever. And from my perspective, I had this huge passion towards leading and driving change projects. And that led me from, you know, consulting into, uh, banking and then onto the IT side and then, you know, as a CIO and then over to um, uh, technology companies uh, on the commercial side selling into enterprises because I used to be a buyer and, and then I became a seller again. And, um, and so it's that complement of capabilities that when I was working for General Electric, I had been asked to help drive commercial intensity at the company, particularly around selling their digital capabilities inside their services organizations. Yeah. When Microsoft reached out, it was kind of like, we we like your background because you've done so many different things and because the one common theme is change. And we need to change and we need leaders who understand how to do that. And we're hoping that can be you. So for people who are watching or listening to this who want to become senior leaders inside of an organization, maybe not president, maybe VP, director, yeah. SVP, who knows. Yeah. How important is that working in different geographies and different teams and getting access to all aspects of the business? How crucial is that? Um, so from my perspective, the the learning is, is so interesting because I was just having a conversation this weekend with a friend who's an executive at a large health uh, company. And um, we were talking about generalists, right? Who, you know, a lot yeah. of companies kind of grew uh, generalists and you go and you went and you ran different functions and then you ran uh, different 
parts of the business and P&Ls, and then you made sure that you ticked off the global box and, you know, moved your family for a couple of years, and then you came back, and, and it was almost like moving across was the most important thing. Now, I really think that the pendulum is swinging back, and we need people who are deep in certain things, and um, I always tell people I'm working with, you you got to pick. Are you going to be that generalist, or are you going to be somebody who goes deep in one thing, whether it's a function like finance and you want to be a CFO and you've always known that, yeah. or, you know, it, is it, um, you know, something horizontal that you're picking like change or, or, you know, something like that. And, um, I don't think there's a right answer. I think the world is going to continue to be hybrid, uh, cause we need both. We need the deep experts and then we need, you know, the, the, the people who, can kind of uh, be a utility player and pinch hit. I think it's getting harder to get the big jobs as a utility player, you know, that hasn't at least gone deep in certain things and owned the implementation of the changes that they've dreamed up. The days of doing something for 18 months and moving on, I think are gone. I think that's very, very deleterious to your overall experience. I think you need to own what you've built and prove that it works before you move on to the next thing. And that's not 18 months, that's three years, in my opinion. Um, yeah. And then global experience, you know, I, I've lived all over the United States and I've traveled all over the world spending, you know, no more than five months, I think is the longest place that, you know, I ever did a project. I was, it just happened to be in South Korea. Um, <laughs> but I've pretty much been to, you know, dozens of countries and spent an enormous amount of time because proximity is super key. So if you want to be a leader in a global company, you're going to have to show that you've learned about the different cultures that are going to be on the hook for buying whatever it is that you're selling. And you can only get that with proximity and partnership from the people in those geographies who are willing to teach you about the nuances of those cultures. That can never replace, you know, a few years of assignment in those those different geos, which I'm a huge proponent of, but I yep. personally never actually relocated my family to another country. Yeah, so that different exposure, it sounds like, is is important to different... I think it is. And, and different people as well, right? I mean, right. different backgrounds <laughs> to, to learn as much as you can. Uh, do you think COVID has changed leadership much? Oh, heck yes. Yeah. Hi, I mean, where do, you, where do you start with that one, right? Yeah, so the first thing is crisis management. It reminded us all that that is a core capability that every leader needs to have. Um, and that there's this moment of surge capacity where you're responding and how you handle that with the, with optimism, with calm, um, with organization to give all of your people comfort that, hey, we're in this together, we're gonna get through it. That's like one whole area of expertise that I think we were all reminded of how important it is. And I'm, I'm particularly proud of how they kind of not just, they didn't just bring that game to us inside the company, but we brought a lot of that to our customers. The second thing is the agility of your portfolio and your go to market and, and okay, the world just changed overnight for Microsoft. You know, how did, how do we take our existing technology capabilities, which so many companies were slow to adopt, and make it easier for them to adopt so that they can do years of digital transformation in hours and days. So just so that they could stay in business. And that was a whole different sort of crisis management, you know, and response that that we needed to do. But then there's the, you run out of surge capacity, Jacob. I think we all realize that whether we're an individual contributor or a leader of large teams, it's it's been monotonous and I don't know about you, but you know, I see the fatigue in myself and my people. I see days where we're overwhelmed and days where we think everything's gonna be fine and, and there's no telling which day it's gonna be when you wake up. It's really kind of interesting. And so this notion of employee experience and employee wellness has become of paramount importance, which is fascinating because it always should have been but I think today, you know, now we realize it's almost existential that we have that uh, forefront in our mind. Well, what do you personally look for in a leader? So somebody that you want to promote inside of your company uh, to be a senior yeah. member of your team. What are the qualities you look for? Yeah, you know, 
I liked it when I arrived and learned what the, because it resonated so much with what I had always kind of emphasized. Um, but I think that the notion of laying out what that is for teams is really important. And it's uh, a leader is somebody who can generate clarity so that we all know where it is that we're trying, we're headed, right? Yeah. Um, it's about generating energy, right? Because you got to get people excited and motivated to, to go chase whatever that goal is. And then it's about knowing how to deliver success and being able to define it in a way that resonates with every single human on the ground. And so those three kind of notions of clarity, energy, and success are the fundamentals of what you need to have in order to be a leader, you know, certainly on my team. But I would say on, on any team, those qualities are really important, even, at, like I said, at the individual contributor level, because if you have somebody that that can demonstrate that um, just as a collaborative member of the team, then you know that they're going to be pre-qualified to be a great people manager, yep. right? So we look for it at individuals. And then as you sort of advance through the ranks, we're looking for more and more intensive examples of how you bring that to bear. What do you think of, uh, and it, I hear this sometimes, I'm curious if, if you come across this, so people who are very, very excited about leadership, but sometimes they feel like their leaders or the organization is kind of clipping their wings, so to speak. Um, do you think it's important for a leader who feels like they're not unable, unable to unlock their full potential to, to move elsewhere or to try to figure it out within the company that they're already a part of? Yeah, again, great question. And so you look at my past, I've worked for six companies. So you go, oh, well, you know, from one perspective, you bounce around. From another perspective, I have had kind of a long career. I'm on the back nine, but um, I always went to a new company because of the opportunity that was there. Hmm. And um, and so I'm a strong believer that it's okay. You don't have to work for the same company for 30 years and go from the bottom to the top every time. That's just not, it's not, that's not the reality that we live in, right? Yeah. However, I do think there's this notion of organizational patience. I've had to actually develop some of that myself um, because you can't just peel out and go get a better offer every time something's not going your way. And I mean, we all know we're going to bump into leaders that don't necessarily bring out the best in all of us. And no. I think developing this notion of you know resilience and how to deal with that is super important for the longevity of a career, but also to develop the empathy for those people that you start to manage of what are the things that you need to avoid because they didn't work for you. You don't want to repeat history and make the same mistakes that man, you know, your bad managers made, right? Yeah. So, but all of that requires a growth mindset. You got to be totally in the game to learn. And you have to realize that the pace of change of the market that we're living in is also putting pressure on the pace of change in our leadership styles, our organizational frameworks, et cetera. So the bad boss that you're working for today, with the exception of if I'm on the senior leadership team reporting to the CEO who's not going anywhere, you know, I, I always tell middle management, like it's literally anywhere from 90 days to 18 months could be the time that you have to deal with this. and that amount of time is is not that long. You can almost hold your breath for that long. So hmm. muscle through it and see what you're going to learn and how you're going to apply those learnings as as the takeaway. That being you said, if you're being demeaned or if there's, you know, real issues with how you're being treated, you know, emotionally, you got to fix that. You work yeah. with HR, you work with peers, you work with other managers or mentors to address it. And of course, you have open and transparent conversations with your managers, but... Couldn't agree more. Uh, what do you think the biggest difference is between mid-level leaders and senior level leaders? Uh, I, I mean, not from a functional perspective, but as far as skills or mindsets, yeah. what is it that the senior leaders can do that the mid-level leaders, they're not quite there yet? So there's this notion when you're driving change, uh, it's called the frozen middle. And the frozen middle is like this phenomenon. You can read about it in you know Harvard case studies and things like that. It's this notion of human behavior. You know, we we are we all pivot towards the things we're most comfortable with. So when you're trying to drive change, you kind of lean into 
well, I like the idea of change, but I don't actually want to change the things I do every single day because that's uncomfortable. Yeah. And so it's the comfortable stuff that I'm going to stick with. And one of the things inside of that frozen middle that we're learning about as a team is this, this kind of notion of implementation versus ownership. So, and I can tell, I could spot the difference with like, a three minute conversation now with anybody in my mm-hmm. organization. And if, if a middle manager is implementing change, there's huge risk. Okay. And the risk comes from the perspective of, you know, they read or they hear about whatever it is that they're supposed to get their teams to do. And they attribute accountability to the leader. Like Kate wants us to drive culture change. So we're going to have to do X, Y, and Z, you know, box ticking event. That's a middle manager who's kind of implementing and will immediately fall back to what's comfortable for them and will kind of represent that frozen middle, if you will. A middle manager who owns the change themselves and says, here's what we're trying to do at Microsoft. Here's our role in that story. And they bring passion and clarity to it and it's theirs and they're telling their people we have to do this because here's the outcome that we're seeking and this is this is the role that we can play in that and they get excited about that that is the difference between somebody who can run the place versus somebody who can't i love it and by the time they get to be you know on the executive leadership team I'm looking for ownership left to right of everything Satya Nadella has has laid out for us and he has laid it all out. And all we got to do is excite our people to get through that. But but it's hard, you know, and finding finding managers who understand the nuances between those two things and have the courage to be vulnerable and get it wrong. That's that's night and day. Yeah, I love that distinction between implementation and ownership because there's a fine line, but um, but it's also very, very clear who's right. implementing versus who has uh, some sort of stake in it. Right. Leadership is also one of those things that's changing all the time. Mm. Do you do anything special to, to keep up, um, to make sure that you're still relevant, current? Uh, is, so it's a great question. Um, look, we, we all are on the hook to continue to improve our game and to learn and, and to figure out like what's a new technique or a new methodology or new inspiration that I can use yeah. to show up at work and get everybody excited about, you know, as I own these changes, right? And um, I think we're all on the hook to keep reading. There's, there's, you can't get around that. There's, there's Blinkist and things like that, that maybe give you a little bit of a shortcut where you get the nuggets. Um, but the reality is you, you got to stay fresh on the theory. I, I adore the works of Brene Brown, Adam Grant. Um, I'm starting to read more from just leaders that, you know, I, I knew or had, you know, a, a sort of a passion for what they were doing. And I'll always keep one or more of those by my bedside, you know, as, as my inspiration. I, I will say that, um, you know, as leaders today, with all the information that's available, when I wake up in the morning, I'm expected to know everything that's going on in the marketplace, yeah. everything that's going on in my country, which is my territory, um, you know, the latest and the greatest management techniques. And so it's it's super hard to do that. And it is. And I I kind of use my own way of, of you know, doing shortcuts. Like, for example, I follow every news source on um, Instagram. So, you know, talking about like NPR, all of my favorite journalists, um, the BBC, you know, various global networks, et cetera. And I have it on a separate channel and I fly through it and I can get most of what I need. I also follow the Wall Street Journal and uh, the New York Times on that as well. And I'm getting the highlights and it gets smarter as, you know, the more things I dig into, it plates up some stuff. So you have to be careful about that. But it's a fabulous way in 15 minutes over a cup of coffee while I'm warming up for the day to make sure that nothing breaking had come through that, you know, I wasn't sort of on. And then and then I exercise a lot. So I'm 
super into podcasts because that's also a way where you're not just sitting there page by page or digital page by digital page. And you get um, these sort of characters in your head talking about all the things that we need to know. So I guess there's no one magic bullet for me. I'm kind of looking for it everywhere. How do you, uh, since you were talking about coffee when you're warming up your day, how do you um, plan or structure your day? Um, well, so I have a lot of help. <laughs> right? So, you know, I mean, personally, I, I'm one of those people that needs a lot of sleep. So I shoot for eight uh, hours, which is uh, highly unusual, I think, for my peer group. I know a, yeah. lot of, you know a lot of my peers are like, hey, if I get five, I'm good. If I get five, I'm close to death. Um, so I make space for that and that actually requires a huge amount of discipline. So my family understands that I'm doing that. I, I kind of open up the 10 to six area for I'm either sleeping or trying to sleep during, during that time. That's super important to get out of the gate. I get out of the gate, gate with all the reading and the coffee. And then, and then the day is kind of balanced. I spend, uh, probably about 20% of my time on my people one-to-ones learning about them, or even community events, making sure I have proximity to what's on their minds. I spent another, you know, quarter of the time um, on deals and the, and the business and making yeah. sure that, you know, the context of what we're doing is, is right. I spend, you know, another quarter of the time uh, meeting with customers uh, to make sure that I'm talking with them pretty much every day. We used to do it before COVID, I used to do it in waves, like a week a month, I would immerse in a, in a week of customer stuff and then we would process it all. I don't need to do that anymore because I don't have to fly there. So I do it every single yeah. day instead. And you know, I have a, an expectation of how many customers I can talk to every single day. And then the last quarter is like, you know, the emergency of the day, right? You're, you're always getting something coming in hot that you have to kind of rearrange, but that's sort of how we try and structure it so I can be with my, my people and customers and, and, you know, think about the, the scorecard and the nature of the business, but then also leave some flexibility for whatever it is that's happening that moment. Is there something that you think you do on a regular basis that makes you a better leader? Like, a, I don't know, your personal leadership tip, hack, technique, strategy that uh, you do? Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just use that word proximity. I, I, I learned it from Brian Stevenson you know, um, the, uh, the author of Just Mercy yep. and um, just this incredible leader who spent his entire, uh, you know, career after Harvard Law, uh, dedicating his life to serving those that weren't um, properly served by, you know, all of our, um, our, you know, processes in the country. And um, I went to visit him in Montgomery, Alabama. And I said, hey, look, how are you doing this whole empathic leadership thing and how do i as somebody who has a 10,000 person organization how do i show up in that way and how do i drive it at scale and he gave us this formula for it you know you, empathy requires proximity and then you got to you know be a great storyteller and, and create a narrative he, you have to be hopeful you can't be negative yeah. all the time and then you have to learn how to actually action everything that you're doing i honed in on this one thing called proximity and said how close am i to the things that matter most. Customers, our people, and our, our business itself. And I took a good long look in the mirror and I was like, you know, I, I don't think I'm nearly close enough. I spent a whole lot more time in corporate, you know, headquarters metaphorically than I should. And so I, I really worked with my leadership team and with all of the uh, extended leadership team to, to change that and created a quarter of the time for one-to-ones with people at all levels in the business and a quarter of the time, you know, for one-to-ones with customers at all levels in the organization. And I think it's made a, a really big mistake. That's not to say that I'm like this perfect leader or anything, but if there was one thing that I would say has helped me improve my game over the past couple of years, it's every day waking up and saying how close to the things that matter most, am I? Or am I just hmm. counting on filters all the time? The story of the story of the story of the story, by the time it gets to me, do I really do I yeah. really know details? Now you can't micromanage, but proximity is a very, very, very powerful tool. How important is the relationship aspect of being a good leader? Because sometimes 
we can get very caught up on um, you know closing deals, making a lot of money, mm-hmm. process, delegating. But you've mentioned several times that you make a lot of time for people, for one-on-ones, for customers. Yeah. Is the relationship aspect still very crucial for your su- or for anybody's success uh, as a leader? I think it's everything. I think, so we have to we have to unlock people in order to unlock the path to performance. Right, yeah. you're going to get performance if you can unlock your people. And the only way you can unlock your people is if they feel deeply trusted, if they feel like they have everything they need from you and the company, and if they don't have it, if you're trying to get it for them, it keeps them in flight for a really long time. Uh, you know, if they feel like they can be successful, like there are all these things that if you can unlock a person, you just be so excited by how far they can go and it's the people that drive this business at scale and that's again it's kind of like another thing that i've learned is that i can't be everywhere and do everything i can't micromanage this i have to do this at scale and the way to unlock the people is to get close to them to understand what it is that they need to be that evangelist right back to you know, the, the leaders of the company to say, okay, guys, this is what it's going to take for us to be successful. You're not pointing fingers or blaming anybody. You're saying, here's what great looks like. And here's what your role in that, in that great story is, you know, help me help our team deliver customer success. And all of that, I think is relationship based is people based. Yep. No, I, of course I agree with everything you're saying. Uh, if you could go back in time and give yourself some advice, mm-hmm. what would you tell your younger self? Um, prob- probably uh, stop listening to the voice inside your head. First, first of all, this whole thing is like, it all seems so important every day, every mistake yeah. you make, every win you have seems so big. And then and then when you start to have a couple decades under your belt, you realize it's it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. So... You probably should think that way from day one, but you don't have enough context to understand that. That's the first thing. But the second thing is most of us are are competing more with the voice in our head than with any external factor. And that voice in your head can keep you from learning. It can make you feel ashamed when you make mistakes. You know, it can really be deleterious to your growth. And one of the things that even just at this phase of my career that I'm learning to do is to make it quiet and Mm. to have the voice in my head, give me a break because I'm (laughs) I'm working hard. I'm trying to do my best and I'm going to keep skinning my knee. But you know, that, that I think is the most important thing. I think the other thing is the practicing. So there's one thing to learn something theoretically. You read that book, you listen to that podcast, you, you know, you acquire knowledge somehow. I find that if I don't practice it in everyday life, that I haven't actually gained that learning. And you have to be very intentional about how it is that you're going to grow and what you're going to apply in order for it to be super tangible and translatable to your people and codified in a way that you can put in your performance review, for example. Yeah. And so those are the two things, the voice inside my head and get more intentional about what I was going to learn, how I was going to practice that on a regular basis. The voice inside your head is an interesting one because I feel like a lot of people struggle with that. Yeah. Um, any tips that you have found to be effective to either quiet it or maybe turn it into a more positive voice instead of maybe one that can be more negative or critical? Yeah. You know, I said that I was a huge fan of, of Brene Brown. We're rolling her training, Dare to Lead, out to, you know, all 10,000 people. We're on week two of rolling it out to the individual contributors now. And there's a section called Rising Strong. Uh, and Rising Strong is all about resilience through failure and the techniques that you use. And the thing that resonates most with me is this, this idea that if you're quiet about something, you know, embarrassing or humiliating or shameful or whatever, um, yeah. it tends to balloon and grow and keep you up at night and overtake aspects of your life. That's certainly true with me. And that's the voice inside your head that's negative that's saying, wow, you really screwed up. And you know, it can wake me up out of a dead sleep. 
And, um, and we talked about how, how much sleep I need in order to, to be healthy and, and productive. And so I, I, I took that chapter really seriously and said, I want, I want to kind of conquer this thing. And, um, the first step to it is actually addressing it and writing it down. Like, what is your biggest fear? What, that you look like an idiot or that like people... actually writing it down? Yeah. Like, like, and so you, you go and you actually, you know, it's really funny. I have this book in, in my desk here and it's a, it's, it's a workbook. Um, and there's a section in here for the voice inside your head. And when you're going through an embarrassing moment or a failure or a setback of some kind, first step is you write down what that setback was. And the second step is you write down every fear that you have associated with it. And I'll, I'll give you a great example. Remember mm. we talked about learning and trying to practice? Yeah. Well, so I'm doing this, right? Because I'm asking everybody to do it. So I've got a, a, you know, I've got to demonstrate that. I had this moment in a, an SLT meeting with Satya and staff a couple weeks ago. And I asked a question that many interpreted as, you know, not the smartest question that anybody's ever asked. And I immediately felt that hot face and embarrassment. And I, I was kind of like, oh, shoot. And, you know, in a virtual world, when the conversation moves on, you can't, you can't bring everybody back and clarify, especially if it's just to address your own humiliation. <laughs> well, so, you know, that night I'm like staring at the ceiling, you know, imagining in my head that this was 10 times worse than it probably really was. And so the next day we're at breakfast, my daughter, and my husband, and I'm like, guys, I got, I got to, you know, do something. And they're like, okay. And I said, I got to tell you what happened yesterday and what is going on in my mind and everything. And you name it. And that big fat shame bubble turns into this tiny little molecule that you just toss away. So they actually said, I don't think that was a dumb question. And I was like, well, you weren't there. And they're like, no, no, listen to us. That wasn't a dumb question. And he, you know, and then, and then when you get this sort of third party opinion and you've actually put it on the table of how you feel about something, you start to realize 99% of it is your yeah. imagination. Yeah. And the reality is, as Eleanor Roosevelt said, stop worrying about how people, what people think about you. Cause the truth is they're not. Right. And if that's like one of these moments where you're like, oh, my gosh, you know, they're not thinking about me. Well, am I relieved or am I kind of disappointed about that? Which is a whole nother set of issues. But it's a really important thing is like if you can quiet the voice inside your head with these tools, it is breakthrough. And it, yeah. it's going to give you a lot more runway to learn. I love that. Um, I think that's a fan. I love the analogy of like the shame bubble to a tiny molecule that you just throw over your head. Um, I know we only have a couple of minutes left, so um, maybe just a few last questions to wrap up. Uh, first one is, what is the best piece of advice that you have for aspiring leaders? So people who are not in a leadership position yet, but who want to get there. Mm -hmm. Any advice for that group? Demonstrate it now. De be, the, be the leader, the people manager, the people leader that you want to be. Be that person right now. Use whatever your role is to create clarity, generate energy, and deliver success. Because those are the muscles that you need to lead people. And you can mm -hmm. practice it no matter what your job is. Literally, if you're if you're in a customer call center and you're sitting on the desk, you know, taking calls, you can do it there just like you can do it if you're leading a 10,000 person organization. Yeah. What about advice for seasoned leaders? So people who have been in leadership, um, but they want to get better. They want to keep improving. They aspire to, to get to your level. What advice do you have for them? I, I think it's seeking that, that learning, that m kind of the idea that your game is not fixed, right? That it's got, it can constantly get better. No matter who you are, you can get better and better and better but you have to open yourself up to it. I think the, I think the kryptonite for leaders is hubris. Thinking wow. you're right, thinking you know the answer, deadly. And, and especially when you're in the middle manager, you know, trying to go up to the next few levels, it's super deadly because you're perceived as being narrow in your thought and, and showing up to the boardroom to prove you're right instead of showing up to the boardroom to get it right is all the difference in the world. And I think something that a lot of times leaders, I, you know, I, I know for the past couple of decades, before I started really 
understanding what my role is. I thought I was supposed to be right and being right was how I got promoted to the next level. That is not the role of a leader. The role of a leader mm -hmm. is bringing everybody together with diversity of thought and perspective to try and figure out the best answers to the problems today, which may be different than tomorrow. So you have to be agile in that process. Yeah. And you actually answered the next question I was going to ask you, and that was uh, the most dangerous trait that a leader can possess, but you already said hubris. And hubris that's actually... started with the Romans, right? Yeah. And if you look at the downfall of every single, you know, sort of leader or organization, whether it's in corporate or whether it's government or, you know, it doesn't matter. Hubris is, is the kryptonite of leadership. Yeah. And, and a couple of people I've interviewed actually said that same thing. So couldn't agree more. Uh, and maybe one of the last questions for you, is there a resource that you think leaders need to be aware of, whether it's a book, a podcast, anything that you think um, is important for people who are watching or listening to this to check out to become a better leader? Um, I, again, I'll just tell you my two favorites, and I typically listen to their podcasts and read all their books is Adam Grant and, uh, and Brene Brown. And, and by the way, there's, there's overlap there. You know, I started yeah. with Carol Dweck with the growth mindset of being the single most important source for leaders and working on that every single day. And then I kind of fell in love with the next step being Brene, you know, and her, the idea of vulnerability in the context of learning. And now Adam Grant's taking it to a new level where I, I think he's bring, bringing some fresh context and connecting it to the corporate world really with a, a great amount of facility. The other thing is, John Levy is writing a book or has written a book. It's coming out soon. He's um, the uh, uh, founder of The Influencers. And it's this notion hmm. of creating relationships and um, taking all of these things that these social scientists and behaviors have created and taking it to the next level in terms of ap applicability to, um, to sales, which is, just happens to be one of my passions, right? <laughs> so I don't know. And every year I kind of try and glue the next thought leader on to that trajectory. And so those that's kind of the sources that I love to point people to because they've inspired me so much. But I think everybody can come up with their own list, right, Jacob? Yep, yep. Uh, and very last question for you. Um, is there something that you think I should have asked you but didn't about how to become a better or, or more effective leader? Um, or anything else that you want to share that we you know, need to? You know, other than forgetting to start with my favorite color, I don't I don't think so. I think we covered a lot of things. And, um, you know, like I said, it's it's the this notion of growth mindset that's the most important thing. And how do you actually get that, I think, is the fundamental question for all leaders. How do you get to the point where you can learn and grow every single day? And, and I think uh, all of your questions kind of laddered up to that. I hope so. Well, Kate, um, thank you again for taking time out of your day and uh, sharing your insights. I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. Creating clarity helps teams move in the same direction toward the same purpose. Generating energy breathes life into each project concept, growth mindset. And delivering success keeps each team solutions and customer focused. Don't be a know-it-all, be a learn-it-all.